mark. So again, we've assigned up to 42 so far. Hopefully some of us have started some of it. Um, I'm opening up for questions at this point, Iden. Can you do one from 13 through 18? Sure. Does anybody have a preference on 13 through 18? Since Iden's happy with any of those. No? Okay. Well, I'll just pick one then. Uh, how about 14? So here we're looking, this is like our given information is the row. So we're looking for S. We know that our angles in radians, so I'm going to use the radian version of my arc length formula, and I have everything I need because I have theta and I have my radius, so I'm just plugging in. And now I'll just go to my calculator. Arc length is a distance, so it makes no sense to write that in terms of pi. You could if you wanted to, but I'm just going to write it as a decimal. So I have uh, about 1.71, and the unit here should be meters to match my unit for the radius. That's it. So I'm using the angle measure to decide which formula I use. And then the uh, from there I fill in the other two values that I've given and do some little bit of algebra. Is that cool, Aiden? So again, you just the row tells you the information, and you use the information from the row for that problem. Charlie. Can you set up the Sure. So 15. Again, I notice it's a radian problem. So again, the arc length formula I'm going to use is the radian version. S is two point or six point two one. Uh, theta is three point two, and we're going to solve that for R. And you just do some algebra one from there. Yes, uh, Grace. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you have to use the degree formula there, or you could convert that degree measure into uh, radians. Either is okay, but that's the degree version. So, again, you're just filling in the stuff that you know and solving for the missing part. Does that feel okay? Other questions from homeworks? Okie dokie. Today is a very special day. Today we break the shackles of the right triangle and we will extend our definition for sine, cosine, and tangent to cover angles of any size. Very exciting. So, remind me, when we're in geometry class, what's the biggest angle you could draw on a sheet of paper? What's a 360 degree angle look like? But that's not an angle. An angle has like two arms, right? 180, right? Everybody agree? Straight line was the biggest angle you could draw because it had to have like two arms that met at a vertex. Our first order of business is to cook up a new way to draw an angle so that you can draw an angle bigger than 180, as big as you want, and also negative. 
So that's our first order of business. So this is how we do it. Is I'm going to take the xy axis. And I'm going to embed the vertex of my angle at the origin. I'm then going to fix one arm of my angle onto the positive x-axis. We call that arm of our angle the initial side. And then the other arm of our angle, we're going to rotate counterclockwise until we've covered however many degrees we'd like. So if I want, uh, you know, 315 degrees, well, I start at the initial side. And how much is a quadrant? How many degrees is in one quadrant on the x-y axis? 90, right? Because the axes are perpendicular to one another. So if I'm going 315 degrees, if I'm rotating, starting at the initial side, I go 90, 180, 270, and then like 45 more. I call this arm of my angle the terminal side. That's the one that's going to rotate around. And this situation where I've embedded the vertex at the origin and fixed one arm of my angle at the initial side and then rotate, this is called a standard position angle. Critical skill that you're able to draw effectively a standard position angle, that you're able to get it to draw it so that your terminal side of your angle lies in the correct quadrant, and that you're able to effectively tell what angles are on either side or with the angle the terminal side forms with respect to the x and with respect to the y axes. So, like in this picture, we know that the angle formed with the y-axis is 45. What would the angle formed with the x-axis have to be? 45, why? Because the two have to add up to 90, because there's 90 degrees in the quadrant, right? Easy, but like we have to be able to do this effectively. Let's draw some more, yeah? make a new axis here. So uh, the natural question would be, okay, Mr. Kulik, um, what about something that's like bigger than 360? What do I do with that, right? Yeah, so let's say we want to do a 480 degree, but Ein's got it. So again, we start vertex at the origin, Initial side on the x-axis, so 90, 180, 270, 360, uh, 450, and then 30 degrees more. And there's my 480 degree angle. When you're drawing these, do you need to include the spiral like I've done? Yes. That's part of drawing your standard position angle. But all we're really doing is counting, right? So far, so good. Now, I've made the claim that we can do this for negative angles also. Well, how the heck am I going to do that, Mr. Kulik? Again, ahead of the game here. So if I do... Um, say negative 240, again, we start the same idea. Vertex fixed at the origin, initial side on the positive x-axis. And then instead of rotating counterclockwise like we did for a positive angle, we're going to rotate clockwise 
for the negative angle. So negative 90, negative 180, and then like negative 60 more. Put me there. So far, so good. What do you guys think? Can you do this? Draw the pictures, Miriam? Well, I did like negative 90, negative 90, and then negative 60 gets me to 240. So it's a little bit more than halfway, I think. I tried to draw it that way anyways. Again, I won't be super duper picky, like you're just kind of guesstimating, but like if it's over 45, it should be more than halfway. If it's less than 45, it should be less than halfway. You know, like I'm not going to be like a maniac about it, but if you try to do, you know, if you tried to put it like here and call it 60 degrees, I'd have a problem with it, right? But if you put it, you know, like here and said that was 60, I'd be like, all right, whatever, close enough. Feel okay? So I'm just, I'm not really doing anything. I'm just like, is it more than halfway or less than halfway? And I'm just kind of eyeballing. Uh, take a look at these last two angles we've drawn, the 480 and the negative 240. You know, do you notice anything about their terminal sides? Put that in there for you. Tell me all. What do we notice about the terminal sides of these two angles? These are different angles, right? What's the location of the terminal side, though? It's in the same spot, right? Everybody agree? They're both in the third quadrant. They're both like 30 degrees past the y-axis or... 60 degrees up from the x-axis. Everybody agree? This is a special situation. This deserves a name where we have two different angles, but their terminal sides are in the exact same location. This gets a special name. When this happens, we call these angles co-terminal. So again, angles with different measurement, but they have the same terminal side. So here's my next question to you. How many angles are coterminal to say 30 degrees? What do you think? How many of those do we got? Who's going to take a risk and feel like they got an answer to this? How many of them are there that are coterminal to 30? More than two. More than three. Infinitely many. Excellent. Why is there infinitely many? Because you can keep going around and around and around, right? So, like if I have 30 degrees. I can get a new coterminal angle by going around one more time. Or I can get another one by going around two times, or three times, or four times, or five times, or and not just forward I could go. What else could I do? I could go clockwise also, right? And do stuff like that. Everybody's okay? Okay, so I have infinitely many coterminal angles. How the heck do I represent those? Well, since all we're doing is like a full rotation past 
the angle, we're just going to say that those coterminal angles are 30 degrees, and then every 360 degrees after that. So k is a parameter there. It's going to represent an integer. Remember, the integers are positive or negative whole numbers. So if k is 7, we're just going to do 7 rotations and then go the 30 degrees. And that'll be coterminal. If k was minus 5, we'll do 5 rotations the other way and then go the 30 degrees. And then... Yes? Absolutely, yeah, if that's in your way. Don't even have to ask. Just stand up and move it. I don't ever even use it. I don't know how it ends up moving. What do you guys think? Is this okay? This is this represents all the angles coterminal to 30 degrees. That's how we write it. Because there's infinitely many of them. I can't list them. What am I going to say? I'm going to say 30 degrees and then everything that's a full rotation more or less than that. Everybody's okay with that idea? So that's just the way that we say like 30 degrees and everything coterminal to it. Because in a way, all these angles are kind of the same, right? If their terminal side and initial side are in the exact same locations, they're still kind of the same angle, even though they have different measures. They're kind of the same. Okay, uh, let's do a numeric example just to kind of help solidify this concept a little bit more. But we've done like all the hard parts. Okay, uh, find two angles coterminal to 47 degrees. Try this on your own. Take a minute. Find two angles, coterminal 47 degrees. See if you can do it on your own. I'll be calling on people for answers here in a moment. While I take a drink of refreshing Mountain Dew. All right, who's got an angle? Anybody? Shout it out. You had time to find like 10 of them. Who's got one? Iden. Oh, okay. 18, what? 47. 47. I see. Okay. So that was what he did was he did 47 plus 360 times 5 to get that, right? Okay. That's just showing off now. What else did you guys get? Somebody else. I mean, when I did this, I would have just said 407. How'd I get that? Add 360. And then I might have said like uh, 767. How'd I get that? Add another 360. Could I have just added though? I mean, if you wanted, you could have subtracted, right? Oops. 
All right? Any of those answers are fine. Everybody's cool? So you just keep adding 360 or subtracting 360. All those answers are valid. Yes! or the equivalent measure in radians. So if I look at the next one, we want two angles coterm of a pi over three. I'll just do the same thing, right? I'll just add 360 to that. Right, that's how you do it. No, what's the matter? One angle's in radians, the other's in degrees. Can I add those two units directly? No, what do we need to do? You need to convert them to be the same unit. Um, in general, since our angle was given in radians, we'd want our coterminal angles also in radians. So we're gonna convert 360 degrees to radians. What do I need to multiply 360 degrees by to get to radians? This was the conversion factor from last time I told you we want to remember. Should be something we have memorized. And if we don't have it memorized, it should certainly go on your note card, your cheat sheet. Yep. It was pi over 180 was the conversion factor. So when I do that, I notice that 180 and 360, the common divisor between them is 180 degrees. So when I reduce that down and multiply, I end up with 2 pi. So to add pi over 3 and 2 pi, what do you have to have? Starts with a C. Common denominator. What would the common denominator be between pi over 3 and 2 pi? Guys, just 3. Right? So I just need to multiply pi over 3 by 3 over th or pi 2 pi each by 3 over 3. And if I add those, I have the common denominator of 3. What's 1 pi plus 6 pi? 7 pi. Yeah. So there's one coterminal angle. How would I get the next one? How about I just add another 6 pi over 3? Remember, that's the same thing as 2 pi, which is the same as 360. So my second coterminal angle might be 13 pi over 3. So the takeaway, to get an angle coterminal, we just add multiples of 360. Or if our angle's in radians, we add multiples of 2 pi. But that's it. Yes? if it's in radians, and always going to be if it's in degrees. Correct. Everybody happy? So far so good? Easy enough idea, right? All right. Now we've accomplished what we needed to. We can go and complete the task we've been working towards this whole chapter. So the whole goal of this chapter has been to take our definition of sine, cosine, tangent, etc. that was tied to needing to be an acute angle in a right triangle and breaking the shackles of that very narrow definition where you could only do sine, cosine, and tangent on angles between 0 and 90 degrees. 
to being able to do it on angles of any size. In the last section, we just showed how we can represent an angle of any size using the standard position angle notation. Now we're going to use that to build out a new definition of sine, cosine, and tangent that does not rely on side lengths of a triangle. So let's say we have some standard position angle. I'm going to call that angle alpha. Make that a little longer. On that angle alpha, or on that terminal side of that angle alpha, I'm going to pick some point P. I can pick any point on that terminal side except for the origin because I know to define that terminal, or defi to define a line, I need two points. One point will always be the origin. The second point I need to pick somewhere on the terminal side. So as long as I can't pick the origin twice, or else I don't have a line, right? I'm going to call the coordinates of that point just a generic x, y. Everybody good so far? I haven't really done much. If I go to plot x, y, how do I plot a point? Well, I go x units over, and then I go like y units up. What does it kind of look like I've made here? A right triangle. Okay, so one of the legs of my right triangle is x, the other leg is y. What is the hypotenuse going to be? Well, it's going to be this Pythagorean theorem, the square root of x squared plus y squared, right? Now that's a hassle to write down. I'm just going to call that r. So if I want to do sine alpha, I remember sine alpha was opposite over hypotenuse. Well, I have a right triangle I've drawn in here. The opposite side is y, and the hypotenuse is r. So I can say that sine alpha is y over r, right? Everybody's cool? Do you realize what we've just done? What is y? y is a coordinate of a point on the terminal side of my angle, or of my standard position angle. What is r? r is the distance from the origin to that point. I've just defined sine in terms of a coordinate from a point on the standard position angle and the distance of that point to the origin. Is there a right triangle involved in that definition anymore? No, I used my right triangle definition to get the y over r, but if I just want to use y over r, do I need a right triangle anywhere? No, I don't. What I've done is I've just freed us from the right triangle. You guys helped. We did it together. I said I. I don't, shouldn't take all the credit. You guys were passengers. So, doing a similar process, I can define cosine as x over r. I can define tangent as y over x. Cosecant as r over y secant as r over x, and cotangent as x over y. Do you think you should memorize these? Yes. Or at least put them on your note card. But this is not hard to memorize, right? All I really, this is just Sokotoa. I just need to remember that opposite is y, adjacent is x, and hypotenuse is r. And it's just the same thing as Sokotoa.
price. And you're feeling now like, Mr. Kulik, that seemed anticlimactic. It was too easy. It's like, it's still just kind of Sokotoa. We're just, you know, saying other stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess. But here, like, let's look at an example and you can see the, the difference. So here we're given a point, negative 3, 4, that lies on the terminal side of some standard position angle theta. So if I draw this, I'll plot my point. So I go uh, 3 to the left and then 4 up. There's my point. So if I draw my standard position angle, would look like that. Everybody's okay with the picture? The x in this picture is negative 3. The y in this picture, that's 4. And the r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. And we have x and y, right? So take out your calculator. Tell me what r is. Take out your calculator. Plug those numbers in. Tell me what r is. Everybody try it. I'm doing, I ask you to do this for a reason. Yes. Okay, so who of us got 2.65-ish? Okay, several of us. Who of us got five? No one knows how to use their calculator. Then the answer is five. What happened? Let me show you. If I type negative three squared like this, the calculator is going to follow the strict order of operations. It's going to do the exponent and then make the number negative. That's not what we want, right? If we're squaring a negative number, you are always going to want to think about it this way. So when I type this in, I need to type in negative 3 squared plus 4 squared to get our 5. Don't be embarrassed if you made this mistake. It is a super common mistake for students at all levels of mathematics. I'm doing this right now as a favor to you to point this out. It's like an easy, easy mistake to make. Lord knows if this was a problem on the ACT, one of the answers would be like with a 2.65 in it to help punish you for not knowing how to use your calculator properly. <laughs> I know it seems unfair, but like I guarantee you they would do it. Everybody cool? Don't make this mistake again, right? Okay. So that number should be five. So if I do sine theta, that's y over r. Y is four, r is five. Cosecant theta should be easy, though. If sine is 4 over 5, what's cosecant? If sine is 4 over 5, what's cosecant? Sine and cosecant are reciprocals. 
So it's 5 over 4. Cosine is x over r. So that's 3 over 5. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So it is 5 over 3. Tangent is y over x. So that's 4 over negative 3. So cotangent is... Negative three-fourths, right? Does it matter where I put the negative if it's on the three, the four, or out front? It does not. Grace. Oh, ooh, yeah, thank you. Kate, that was the same thing? Thank you for paying attention. If you see me do something stupid and I'm not seeing you, like, interrupt. You're welcome to do that. Be like, and I'll be like, oh my goodness, what is it? And you'd be like, you dropped a negative sign. I'd be like, thank you for warning me before I got like real deep down into the problem and I have to go back and change like 15 things. Everybody feel okay so far? All right. Let's go on and do another example. This will be the last example before we leave for lunch. When we come back from lunch, we will pick up where we left off here. We probably have like probably have like 20 minutes after we get back from lunch, though. We're almost through. I know. Oh, brother. It's almost that. It's almost done. All right. So it says find cosine of 150. I'm going to do this without my calculator. I want to do this exactly. I want to use the new tools we've just developed. So I'm going to start by drawing my standard position angle. I'm going to pick a point P on that terminal side. But what do I do now? Well, what does this angle down here have to be between the x-axis and the terminal side? Good job, Miriam. 30, why? Why does it have to be 30? Great, because a straight line is 180 degrees. We've done 150 degrees of the straight line, so there must be 30 degrees left. Excellent. So if I go and I make my kind of right triangle, this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle, right? Remember, the 30, 60, 90 triangle has specific side lengths. I'm going to write those side length, those ratio of side lengths in terms of an A. I think when I wrote it yesterday, I used an X. I don't want to use X again because I already have X as a coordinate and it's just like abusing the variable X, having it represent two different things. So I'm just going to use like an A. So I have A, oops, A root 3, and then 2A. So remember, this side is like my x, this side is like my y, and this side is like my r. So I have that. But there's a problem. I've made a mistake. I've made this mistake intentionally to see if any of us can catch the mistake. Does anybody see it? What, uh, what quadrant is my point in? Quadrant 2. The x-coordinate in quadrant 2 needs to be negative. negative. So that should really be negative. Right? Because if we think about like quadrant 1, our points are both positive, our coordinates are both positive. In 2, x is negative, but y is positive. In quadrant 3, they're both negative. In quadrant 4, x is positive, y is negative. So if I do cosine of 150, that's x over r. So that's negative a root 3 over 2a. The a's will reduce, leaving us with 
negative root three over two. Go to lunch. We'll finish the rest of this when we get back. I know, I'm starving too. Well, let's just work. I thought we had lunch first. I figure. I, I, when's my, cause my third hour is lunch one. I thought like that's how they were doing it. Yes, no. Okay. My fault. That's okay. You get double lunch today then, huh? Sorry about that. It happens. Just a little bit more to close us out. So, just to rehab, recap, we've gone and we've taken our definition of sine, cosine, and tangent that was linked to right triangles, broke that. We now have a definition for sine, cosine, and tangent that's linked to a point on the terminal side of our standard position angle. But we can do a little bit better than this. Because the part that, and by do a little bit better than this, we can standardize this process a little bit more. So the one thing that's a choice for us is choosing that point P, right? We've just been picking P arbitrarily. We're going to now standardize the process of how we choose our point P. We're going to choose P such that the distance from P to the origin is one unit. Or in other words, R should be equal to one. So remember, we just had sine was y over r, right? Under this new definition, sine would turn into just y over 1, or just plain old y, right? Cosine was x over r. If r is 1, now cosine is just x. Tangent didn't involve r, so it stayed the same. Cosecant was r over y. Now it just becomes 1 over y. Secant was r over x, just now becomes 1 over x. And cotangent didn't involve x at, or didn't involve r at all, it just stayed the same. So far, so good. Now that we've done this, what we'll do is we're going to take <clears throat> the angles that we can calculate the uh, exact value of. So by that, we're talking about angles that are multiples of 30, 45, and 60. And we're going to work out what the sine, cosine, tangent of those, or the sine and cosine of those are. Um, in advance, so we can just kind of look it up. So let's kind of create that right now. So, oops, get out of there. I'm going to start just by going and writing down all my angles that are multiples of 30, 45, or 60. Um, 
315, 330, and back to 360 again. Everybody feels okay? I just filled in some angle numbers, right? Um, so some of these, since the radius is one, the distance from the origin to the circle is one unit. So any of these ang or any of these uh, points that lie on the uh, uh, axis, I can just kind of fill in, right? The radius is one. That tells also tells me the x and y coordinate in that case. Now let's say we look at the thirty degree. So that makes a 30, 60, 90 triangle. If I want the radius to equal 1, A has to be 1 half, right? So this would just turn into root 3 over 2. This one turns into 1 half. So the x coordinate is this side. The y coordinate is the vertical side. And now any of these angles that form 30 degrees with the x axis are going to be the x coordinate's going to be root 3 over 2, and the y coordinate's going to be 1 half. I just might have to make them positive or negative depending on the quadrant they're in. So we can go ahead and do this as we walk along. Oops, that's the wrong spot. So I can do something like that. And now I could continue this process for the 45 degree angle and the 60 degree angle and so on and so forth. I'm not going to show that. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop in the one that's already filled out. I'll put a copy of this into the OneNote also later today so you guys have a freshie. What is this thing called? It's a circle, right, with radius 1, so we call it a unit circle. Now, I'm not going to ever expect you to construct one of these of your own. In, in fact, all I'm going to ask for you ever to be able to do is to just use it to answer questions such as the following. So it says, using the unit circle, find sine of 120, tangent of 5 pi over 4, and then cosecant of 390. So sine 120. I'm going to locate 120 degrees on my unit circle. There it is. Sine, I remember, is, the, is equal to y. There's my y coordinate. I'm done. Whoa! That was way faster than what we did before. We had to draw the picture, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. That's nice. What's the next one again? We have tangent of 5 pi over 4. So I'm going to locate 5 pi over 4 on my unit circle. 5 pi over 4 is right there. Tangent was y over x. So y is negative root 2 over 2. x is negative root 2 over 2. So what is negative root 2 over 2 divided by negative root 2 over 2 equal to? Just 1. Whoa! This is fast, Mr. Gulick. I know, right? All right, last one is cosecant of 390. 
All right, let's just go locate 390 on my unit circle. Let's see, 30, 60, uh, da, 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 180, 210, 270, 330. Oh, no, where's 390 on here? So what do I do? Well, I'm just going to find an angle coterminal to it that is on there. Right? Since I noticed three, 390 is too big, I'll be subtracting. 390 minus 360 is 30 degrees. Oh, 30 degrees. Cosecant is 1 over y. So cosecant 390 is 1 over 1 half. What's that simplify to? Come on, guys, it's 2, right? 1 over something means the reciprocal, right? Reciprocal of 1 half is just... Two. Whoa! This is really fast. Do I have to show any work doing this? No. What are we doing? Just looking stuff up off the unit circle and writing it down. Should I be good at this? Yes. Key skill in this course is going to be able to effectively use the unit circle. On every single test you get for this first semester, will you get a unit circle from me? Yes. Will you have to include on your note card? I wouldn't waste my time doing it because I'm gonna give you a freshie that looks just like this one that I put in here to use every time you take a test in here. But do you have to you know how to use it? Oh buddy, yes sir. Everybody feel okay? Yes! Where'd I get the one half on cosecant 390? Well, cosecant was one over y, and the y coordinate at 390, aka 30 degrees, is one half. Right? Oh. Is that okay? Grace. So you would need to use that definition if you're given a problem like this one up here where you're given a point that's clearly not one unit away from the origin because could I find a point that's still on that same line that's one unit away? Maybe, but it's an awful big hassle. So we only use the new ones when we're going to You use the new ones if you're asked to do sine, cosine, and tangent of an angle on the unit circle. Like instead of doing cosine 150 the way we did it here, you could just look that up off the unit circle, right? Like I find 150, there it is, cosine is x, and I'm done. Much faster than what we did there because what we did there has just been that's what we use to build out the unit circle. Now we're just going to treat it as like a calculator, basically, right? Where it just like we look up the value and we write it down. The same way as we type in the calculator, press enter, we write it down. Same idea. Cool? All right. That's it for this section. At this point, you guys should be able to do 43 through 60. When is that due? Not next or not this Sunday, but next Sunday. This Sunday, you should have just the 1 through 42 and the delta math. Most of us have done the delta math already. We did took time in class to do that. I think that when I looked, I looked a little this morning to kind of see, it seemed like the majority of us had 100% completion on that. Maybe a couple of us are still floating around in the 50s and 70s, so if that's you, try to get that done before Sunday. Uh, but that's that's the story, Morning Glory. I'm done for today. Do you guys have questions for me? Yes, Miriam? This is like a dumb question. Like, 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 I know, can you just like list another example of like an angle that's not on the So if it's an angle that's not on the unit circle, if it's coterminal to an angle on the unit circle,
we can still do it. But if it's not one of those, there's nothing to do. We can't use the unit circle for like cosine of 52. Okay. Like that's, unit circle's not gonna help us. We have to nope, we use a calculator. If you're given a point on the terminal side of a 52 degree angle, then we could do something with it. But if all you have is 52 degree, like sine 52, calculator is the only thing we can do with that. Is that? OK. Um, now, we'll like, in the future, there are some angles that not, are not on the unit circle that we will be able to find the exact values of using the unit circle still, but they're very special situations. So like 15 degrees, it turns out we can do, or 22 and a half degrees we can do. But that's like much later in the semester when we see why we can still do those things. Um, but right now, if it's not on the unit circle or coterminal is something on the unit circle, nothing for us to do. Oops a daisy. You should have answered the spam call. <laughs> no, OK. Um, that's it. You guys feel OK? All right. Uh, what haven't we done yet this chapter? Homework quiz. What should you expect soon? Homework quiz. What sections should you look at? 2, 1, and 2, 2. OK? No. Maybe one of the questions, but in general, no. Because most of what you did in 2, 1 and 2, 2 was like radians to degrees, degrees to radians, arc lengths, stuff like that. I'd expect to see more stuff like that than the delta math. Yes, Kate. Absolutely. The formula's on the thing. Oh, you should know that. I mean, it's just one thing, right? Pi over 180 or 180 over pi, depending on which way you're going. You know? That's not too much. You might convince me to give you the arc length formula. 